Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 7th edition Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game rules by Chaos. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. While we try very hard to stick to language for all ages, listeners should know that this podcast may include mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc., that may bear resemblance to entities living or dead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your keeper. Thank you for joining us again another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I am your keeper, Keeper Michael, and we return to the England chapter of Masks of Nyarlathotep. I want to thank you all for joining us. And then at the top of the show, as we always like to do, remember, we'd like to thank our patron backers. So just remember, all of you wonderful patron folks, we couldn't do it without you, and we greatly appreciate your support. If you would like to join them, stop by the Old Ways Podcast on Patreon and come join the fun. So... We have a lot to get to tonight. We have some fun things happening in Masks of Nyarlathotep, so we're going to start with introductions. To my right. This is Lonnie. I'm playing Lawrence Edward Oliver Forsyth, and I met a strange lady, and she made me nervous. She may take me in and give me breakfast. I don't know. I sincerely doubt that. Uh, To his right. This is Morgan. I play Lillian Lane, and hopefully I'm in bed right now if it's in the evening. Mm, maybe we'll see how that works uh, at the end of the table this is jake i'll be playing jack doyle and um i'm going to be going with uh, Forsyth to keep him out of trouble because he is a known troublemaker it's true it's true it's documented actually uh to yeah. jake's right this is james i'll be playing dr sigmund tartenbach who has been thinking many deep and complicated thoughts you are a thinking uh you're a thinker's man aren't you you're quite uh, quite in depth there. Uh, to the doctor's right. This is Tiffany. I play Maeve O'Shea, and the doctor is falling down my rabbit hole. Hmm. Yeah. Insert this... evil laugh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the editorial note. I appreciate that, uh, Miss O'Shea. <laughs> uh, to Miss O'Shea's right. Uh, this is Alex. I'll be playing Simon Ranger, and I am not the last person to be introduced tonight. You know what? That is a perfect segue. So I would like to welcome, as a special guest star to the show, well, you know what? I'm, I'm going to let them do it themselves. So please. Hi, I'm Rena, and I will be playing a mysterious stranger. Mm. QR foreboding music now. Uh, so we will lift the curtain tonight at the hotel in London where Dr. Tottenbach and Miss O'Shea are making some final preparations uh, before they walk out the door to go towards Camden. So Dr. Miss O'Shea, take it away. Well, I have everything almost packed. Maeve, have you seen the map? Uh, Yeah, it's probably in my bag. Hold on. As I proceed to open the giant satchel. And I think I have the map. Yeah, here it is. Uh, Fundaba, I I've been puzzling, and um, you, you know I am I am a doctor and a man of efficiency, if nothing else. Uh, we have two places to go, right? And we are going mm-hmm. to Camden, but the other place is on the way. So I thinking maybe if we should stop at the place that is near, that is literally on the way, and then out to Camden. Then we only have one trip to make. Yeah. Oh, to go see Samantha first? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it probably makes more sense besides we can get more information. I know I really want to see that house, but... Oh, we maybe... will get there. But, and and uh, here is um, here is my other thought about the house. And I have other business. It, it, it will all tie together. You would understand. But if we are going to a house that we need to examine. I believe that we should bring Miss Lane along. Why? Well, if what I saw, if I saw what I thought I saw, she seems to be in possession of a most amazing ability to discern the things that she touches. And if we are going to a house where we wish to have questions answered, would it not be have someone with such an amazing gift 
bring some along? Hmm? Well, that's also assuming that that house isn't going to hurt her. There aren't any residuals from the ritual that was cast that would also hurt her, and... Well, I think if you were, t- if you were to pose it to Miss Lane as a question as whether or not her safety was involved, she would probably tell you... Well, I don't know exactly what she'd tell you, but it would probably be American for get stuffed. <laughs> And then she would charge into the room, kicking the door open and doing it anyway, right? Well, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, if you if you want to ask her if she wants to come, but... I will. She's got to understand it. Something could hurt her. And it is that care that you are showing that I admire most about you, Liebchen. I will ask her, and we will take care of her as we know that we can, okay? Okay. Doctor gets up grabs his cane and goes over to Mrs. Lane's room. Okay, Miss Lane, you're resting comfortably. uh, Just trying to get over the the, the smell of burned flesh, which has now finally left the room. It's this steady beat, the doctor's cane, that kind of rouses you a bit from your slumber. You can tell he's walking closer towards the uh, adjoined room. Mike, she got rid of that smell of burnt flesh. Well, I mean, I mean, mostly, uh, mostly. Yes. The, the, in the previous episode, she was able to both you and her washed up that, that said, it probably still lingers a bit. Okay. It is uh, it in the area. Now, if it's almost gone, I grab a a spare limb and light it on fire like a torch and make my way to her room. Uh, (laughs) No, I (laughs) can't let that smell dissipate all the way. (laughs) Oh, come on. So, so it's like a it's like a human smudge stick. Is that what? Yeah, saying? exactly. <laughs> okay, gotcha, It'll gotcha. keep gotcha. something away, <laughs> right? Yeah, I go over and knock on her door. I get up from where I'm resting and go answer the door. Doctor, Guten Tag. May I come into your room? I kind of sniff the air a little bit and open the door more. The Don't windows worry. are all open in the room, by the way. <laughs> Don't worry. This time I do not smell as I did last time. Thank heavens. My goodness. In fact, I don't think I will ever smell like that again. I'm hoping. I don't know. I should hope not, because that was just wretched. Wretched it was. Would you like to have a seat? Ah, yes, please. My hip is troublesome. I pull a chair out for him to sit down at one of the the side table. Lillian, I, I have a proposal for you. Um, I think you're a little too old for me, Doctor. Damn. You know, I should, I should have phrased this differently. <laughs> <laughs> kind of chuckles. Uh, do you have any alcohol available, like, st- around your room? I, I do. I was actually going to offer you a drink before you right. started, like, proposing marriage to me. Um, <laughs> but now would you like a drink? I would. <laughs> I go and grab a glass and pour a drink and bring it back. Miss O'Shea and I are going on a brief journey. We are... Um, investigating things about her father. We have two trips to make, two stops, and I have some business that I wish to discuss with you otherwise, but I think your particular set of skills would be quite helpful uh, at one of our destinations. Would you like to come with us, please? I'm not going to be a third wheel for you and Maeve, am I? You do know that a vehicle with three wheels is still fully functional, right? Sure, sure. I just kind, kind of, of look smile. away. He smiles and <laughs> takes the takes the alcohol and kind of takes a sip out of it. Mm. But as I said, I have other business that I wish to discuss with you. Sure. It has been something that I've noticed that we are traveling as a fairly large, fairly obvious group, but we apparently have seem seem to have no aim, no reason for tra- traveling as such a large group, if you understand what I'm saying. Why we're all together instead of... Ah, yes. Haha, <laughs> that, very good. I am thinking, Miss O'Shea is a singer, yes? Performer. Mm-hmm. You, an heiress to, you know, the Elaine Fortune, could perhaps be financing a tour around Europe and other places around the world for Miss O'Shea? <clears throat> I 
that as a cover story that would be acceptable it would not be out of the ordinary to have somebody of wealth finance somebody in the arts absolutely and nor would it be nor would it be strange to have uh, a doctor personal doctor or a bodyguard you, you mean know. assistant yes oh are we talking about mr forsyth I was actually referring to Mr. Doyle. Oh, okay. But Mr. Forsyth as well. He could be my assistant. Thunderbar. Yeah, no, I think that's a good... We should talk that over with the group. I think that's a that's a great cover story. I'm glad you like it. But that is neither here nor there. Something to think about. We will be leaving soon, and we are making sure that we have all that we need. Um. So, so what would my role be on this on this little trip a third wheel of course <laughs> i'm really i'm really good at being the third wheel you really are good. not a third wheel lillian <laughs> you are lillian lane it is amazing that you decided to come with us and i think it is time for you to take this opportunity to do what you want to do so what you want to do in this case is come with me and help me wonderful i will be next door getting things ready he kind of walks over to the door all, like, Yoda-style, like it, things have been settled. I just yeah, you didn't even warn her. What the yeah. hell? <laughs> my mouth kind of gapes open, and I just kind of, yeah. I shrug and turn around and go grab my bag to start packing. Okay. It doesn't take the three of you long to collect the rest of your things. I guess I would specifically ask Ms. O'Shea, are you bringing anything specific? I am definitely bringing my father's books, the information that I wrote down about the ritual from the library at the society, because mm. I was assuming I couldn't take the book with me, and my knife, because sure. you never know when you need it. Lillian, you collect your things and come into the common area, and you see the the two of them just about wrapped up. Doctor, I assume that you're bringing your bag. Indeed. Uh, Anything else you're planning on bringing with you? For this trip? No, just the contents of my bag and my cane. Oh, and I'm also bringing, for sure, Swift's journal, because um, it has the things I need in it. Okay, fair enough. I'm dressed to travel at night. I'm wearing, you know, pants and a shirt and boots. And since I don't know where in the world we're going, my hatchet's in my boot. She's... Wearing her trendy Night Stalker outfit from the Derbyshire era. Yes. You can only bring so many clothes with. No, that's fair. Okay, so the three of you are then in the room together. So where are we going? I lay the map out on the table and trace the route with my finger. It's not very far. Uh, if you're planning on going to the Mulberry residence first, it's quite literally on the way to Camden. So it'll probably take you 20 or so minutes by a foot and tube to get to where the, the Mulberry residence is. And then it's probably another 15 or 20 minutes from there to what you believe is the key estate in Camden. I think it is a wonderful night for a brisk walk, don't you? What time is it? It's probably around 5 p.m. at this point. Oh, okay. Hoping it wasn't like eleven o'clock. <laughs> um, where are we walking to? Uh, point to the first place on Mulberry. I believe we are stopping here first before we go out to here, Camden. And what's the place on Mulberry? Can... Well, Mulberry is the um, just for point of reference. Mulberry is the um, the person's the last name of the person that they're going to go visit. Oh, oh, right. I thought it was the street it was Mulberry. Duh. Yeah, at nope. Mulberry Residence. Sorry, here at the Mulberry Residence. Okay. Uh, it is person who may have information that, about things that involve uh, that are involving Maeve's father. Okay. And I, I've noticed that you have also have a keen eye for detail, and that's part of the reason why I wish you to come with us today. I'd be happy to help in any way I can. I don't press any further into about Maeve's father or anything. Just sure. Did he tell you that it could be dangerous? I mean, more than what we normally have already dealt with. I was gonna. I, I can't imagine there other than dying. I 
can't imagine there'd be much more, but um, he did not, in fact, relay that to me, but that doesn't scare me off. Well, my point is that it's one thing when you chose to join this crew, Motley crew as it is, to figure out things for Elias, but now I'm asking you to come along on something that is personal for me and not to do with this and put yourself potentially in danger for this and for me and not for Elias. I would hope after all of our time together and the things that we've been through that we're we're kind of more than just a motley crew that it's kind of a a mini family that you want to choke sometimes. Did I not mention the danger to life and limb? I I apologize. (laughs) No, you abruptly got up and said, I'll see you in a little bit, and I think, and like, yeah. You know. <laughs> I was correct, it was a little bit. So, <laughs> he tosses a scarf over his shoulder. Shall we? Yeah, let's go. Okay. He holds the door open for the both of them. So, the walk there, uh, if that's what it's going to be, is, I think pleasurable is the wrong word, but it is invigorating. The air is just cool enough here still that you get... Uh, fresh air in your lungs, which after being in a hotel room that slightly smelled of burnt corpse, that's probably pretty invigorating. But it's more than that. There's a hum to London at night, or I should say in the evening, as it were, because it's not dark, dark just yet, but pretty close. The Mulberry Residence is uh, one of many that is in a vast group of uh, high Victorian, well-off buildings in that location. The Houses here look more like manors than they do what you would consider natural London row houses. Uh, They're not full-on estates by any means, but it's pretty clear as you guys get closer to the residence that uh, you have the address for from Lord Walters that the Mulberry family has uh, some financial backing or there there is something to them. This isn't just a normal house. They're they're in a different level class-wise. The house itself is stone, as is the short stone wall that surrounds it. Uh, The wall is probably no more than four or five feet tall. It's more for show than it is for, you know, keeping out Scottish people or whatever. It probably blocked it from at some point. But uh, arrival there is fairly simple. This is a house you can literally walk up and, and knock on the front door of. It's not like a there's no guard posted outside or anything like that. You see a, a double door. Nice heavy English oak door and a bell beside it that you can pull to uh, announce your presence. I gesture up at the bell towards well, Maeve towards the bell. Yeah, I'll pull the bell. So we'll change camera for a moment. There is a, a sound of a member of staff walking through the hall. You can hear the bell has been sounded near the front door. You hear the swift heels of the house butler uh, going towards the front door. His name is Charles. He's mid thirties, maybe coming on to, uh, to his forties soon. He's got two or three kids of his own. He's been in service to the Mulberry family for a good 10 years. He is quiet, direct, and has every attention to detail for you. Miss Mulberry. The door opens to our three investigators. Uh, You see a gentleman in a well-trimmed black suit uh, with blonde brownish hair that's been swept into a comb over. He looks like he's a member of service or perhaps a a butler. Good evening. Uh, May I help you? Yes. My name's Maeve O'Shea and I was wondering if I can speak with Miss Samantha Mulberry. Are you expected? Probably not. Oh, very well. Would you... He looks down at your doctor's bag, Sigmund, and he seems to just add it to the calculation of the entire group. <laughs> and says, oh, but please, uh, come come in, come in. You can... Wouldn't want to leave you uh, out there on the, the stoop there. Come in. Thank you. Ah, uh, yes. Wunderbar. Thank you very much. The inside of the house is majestic. Uh, while not a, a palace by any means... It seems the staff and the house here have gone to great trouble to make sure that their receiving room is uh, well-appointed. 
And uh, Lillian, you see a nearby painting in the next room over that is of a large Arabian horse. I kind of glance over and kind of wander over to the painting and stand in front of it. The uh, member of staff who uh, answered the door walks out and then down a hall. If you'll just be, uh, if you'll just be one moment. Heels go down the hall and arrive outside your door, Miss Mulberry. Excuse me, madam, there's a caller for you at the door? A caller? I'm not expecting anyone today. Um, she's said her name is uh, O'Shea, uh, Miss M- Maeve O'Shea. O'Shea? Uh, are you sure? Quite positive, madam, quite positive. I suppose I'll come see them then. Uh, d- where did you put them? The parlor, the sitting room? Just the parlor, yes. For uh, Would you like me to uh, prepare something for the sitting room? Yes, bring tea, please. Right away. He nods and then steps aside so you can walk out and then uh, heads towards the kitchen. So I'll move fairly quickly down the down the hallway. You uh, arrive in your parlor area with uh, three distinct guests. So if each one of them would care to explain what they look like, you can go from there. Maeve actually looks a lot like her father. She has uh, shorter brown hair and she wears very plain dresses, but they're not full length. They're like to the knee. She has a huge bag with her. I mean, it's like a, like almost like a messenger bag kind of that looks heavy. And she's probably flanked by Dr. Tottenbach. Mm-hmm. Dr. Tottenbach is uh, currently leaning against a polished brass cane. He's dressed in a nice dark brown, uh, well-tailored suit with a kind of white collar, manicured mustache, dark brown hair, just starting to salt and pepper, spectacles, um, creases at the corners of his eyes from smiling, and carrying a doctor's bag that looks fairly old and somewhat beaten up now. Um, Lillian stands behind Dr. and Maeve. Looks wise, she isn't very tall. She's probably about Five, four, five, five, fairly fit, I'm wearing tailored pants, tan, cream colored pants, and a white shirt with a, an overcoat. She's got the shorter brown hair that was, you know, you know, shorter hair that was popular back in the 20s, brown eyes, and she's got a very curious look on her face as to why she's there. So I'll come into the room, uh, and uh, Samantha is very tall. Uh, she's got Long, dark hair that's sort of curled, framing her face, and uh, very high cheekbones, sparkling brown eyes, and she's wearing this long, sort of pale blue dress. It's very well tailored, looks very expensively made, but it is a bit more Edwardian. Uh, it's it's a little bit more 1910s, 19-teens than it is uh, the, the 20s, but it looks very expensive. Uh, and she walks in and uh, holds out a hand to you, Maeve, and says, oh, you must be Miss O'Shea. I'm Samantha. Nice to meet you, Samantha. And uh, who are your uh, friends here? This is Dr. Tottenbach. He bows slightly, and uh, if she offers her hand, he takes it. And this over here is Lillian Lane. I nod. Pleasure to meet you, I'm sure. Uh, What can I do for you? Well, as I understand, you were a part of the uh, Spiritualist Society when my father, Neil, was a part of it. Uh, uh, Yes, uh, the the society. uh, uh, Yes. uh, Please, please come in. uh, Have a seat. We we shouldn't uh, stand here in in the doorway talking. Uh, I've had Charles send for tea. Uh, please, please do sit. And she's going to just sort of usher them further into the parlor and, and point out some some seats. She's going to take an armchair by the fireplace. I will uh, enter and sit. I do the same. Dr. Gladly enters and sits, finds a place to sit down, but only sits once the all of the ladies have sat. Uh, so, uh, Miss Lane, it's, uh, I've heard of you... Uh, of course, I believe my uh, my father may have met yours at, at some point uh, at, at an equestrian fair of some kind. 
Yes, my my father and my family does deal in race horses. It would not be unusual to have met for him to have met your father then. Ah, lovely. And that nice to uh, have you here in in the family home then. Uh, yes. Uh, so, um, and she's trying to get comfortable in her seat a little bit. Like she keeps looking behind, looking at all three of of you. Like she can't decide who she's supposed to be talking to at any given moment. So, uh, how can I uh, help you exactly? Well, I am to understand that uh, Mr. Holmesley purchased a house where all of you, well, the four of you, performed a ritual that my father did not come back from. I, I'm, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, um, I haven't, uh, I'm, I'm not with the society right now. Uh, sh- surely you want to talk to, uh, to Lord Walters. I have. I am also a part of the society. And we went and visited Wormsley already. Ah, uh, uh, yes, uh. I see. Uh, well, I, I I knew your father a little bit, not not very much, uh, Miss O'Shea. He he was a very nice man, uh, one of the first Americans I can remember meeting. He was much nicer than I've heard. He wasn't too energetic or didn't speak too quickly. He was always very polite. Uh, so you're telling me you didn't go to that house in Camden? I've I've been to the house, of course. Uh, she's picking a little bit at the skirt of her dress. What happened to my father? As uh, he, I I I don't know. Uh, I I don't know. I, I don't know what happened to him. Uh, I I know he he disappeared at, at some point. Uh, but I, I don't know what happened to him. I, I don't know where he is. I, I don't know. I, I'm sorry. I, I wish I could tell you where he is. It must be dreadful not knowing where your father is, but uh, I, I don't know. What did he tell you that you were getting the house for? Mr. O'Shea? Uh, he was here. I know he was looking for uh, for some information to, uh, to help. And she looks slightly embarrassed. Uh, your mother, I think, uh, I, I assume, uh, M- Mrs. O'Shea, uh, so he, he was looking for some information that could help, uh, but I, you understand, I didn't speak to him all that much, it's not like we were friends. Well, sure, but you were close enough to all four of you meet at that house and perform something that made him disappear you must uh, understand uh, miss o'shea it is was a very difficult time for me and uh, i i lost one of my dear friends and it's not something i like to talk about it, it's it's I, I would rather not uh, all right uh I, I i would if i could help you find your father i, I would but uh it, I would rather not. That's all well and good. And you can talk about how you lost a dear friend, but I lost my father. At least you had something physical that you could see. So I'm sorry. I'm going to be a crass American and say that you saying you don't want to talk about it is not acceptable. The doctor is carefully watching all three people, other three people in the room, and would love some psychology roles on everyone. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you really can only do like one target at a time, so to speak, because it, it's. For sure. It takes intent. Um, I think Maeve. I've already established one. Right. I think Maeve's psychological situation is pretty clear. Okay. Um, well, Maeve is clear. I'm going to then switch my attention from where it was before to Lillian. I want to see how Lillian is reacting to this. Okay. I guess then what I'll ask uh, Lillian is, are you being an, at all covert or um, an, an attempt to conceal your um, psychological state, whether you're, um, are, you, are you doing anything to, to be, uh, to subterfuge the situation? No, I'm just watching what's going on between Samantha and Maeve. Okay. And yeah. just taking it all in. I'm I mean, I I'm not 
I'm not afraid. I'm not, it's, I, I'm, I'm carefully watching the situation. Okay. So doctor, if you want to roll, then you're, it's not opposed. 63 under 79. Okay. You get a pretty good read for a million. Yeah. She's, she's here. She's paying attention. She's not freaked out or. Okay. She's attentive. Uh, yeah. She's watching. Okay, cool. Yes. Then I just let, I let Maeve keep on her rant. I ain't going to slow her down. Go on with the rage train, girl. The member of staff comes in with a, a tray of saucers and, and tea and begins setting things up in the background. Actually, when he comes in, I take the moment to look over at May or to make sure Lillian is there and say, uh, well, you know, actually, perhaps this is something of a personal matter between the two of them. Miss Lane and I will be right outside. Okay, Miss O'Shea? Sure. And then he offers his arm to Lillian. She raises her an eyebrow at him, and but gets up and takes his arm. Okay. And, you know, as they're walking out of the room, she leans over and whispers, What are we doing? I think perhaps it is best if they speak alone. Samantha is embarrassed and perhaps lying about something, but I think if Miss O'Shea has her alone, perhaps she may find what she needs. Or they might start throwing fireballs at each other. In which case, we will know then, won't we? Come on, Liebchen. <laughs> we will see the grounds. Sounds good. The door closes behind the two of them as they exit, uh, along with the member of staff. And the two of you are surrounded by a moment of pressing silence. So, what happened? Where was he trying to go? All I know about what your father was doing was he was trying to... He said he wanted to pierce the veil. Uh, he, he wanted to see beyond. Uh, as, as I've said, I, I didn't really know him all that well. Uh, he mentioned things about... Uh, the land beyond the walls of sleep. I, I remember that phrase because it was very evocative. Uh, and and uh, he seemed to think that this beyond, whatever it was, would help him find a way to, to help your mother. If you didn't know him that well, why did you agree to do this? I wasn't sure if what we were doing was real. And I thought... After talking to, to Wamsi and, and Ki, we thought that maybe we could learn something, that there was some secret Walters was keeping up in the house and that maybe we could see if it was real. I wanted to see something, not just read about it or or listen to Walters talk or, or other people talk. And if it was fake, then we've all had a good laugh and a lark and... and no harm done, but if it was real, then then it was something, something powerful, you know? And, and so we, we thought we'd just go. It was just supposed to be a, a harmless bit of research, a bit of fun. That, that's all it was supposed to be. I, I wasn't in it for anything super serious. I wasn't going for some sort of ritual. That was never the plan. We, we weren't planning for a ritual. We just, we wanted to look. We wanted to see. And then we got there and things went a little, a little strange. That's all. How did it go a little strange? Didn't all of you participate willingly in this? Yes, that, that was, that was Key's idea. He, he thought, well, we're here. We can, we can try something and. At least I, th I think it was his idea. He's he's the one who who said something about it. Uh, uh, he, he's like, oh well, we'll set something up. It's it's the perfect atmosphere. It feels very gothic. I think was the word he used. So we we thought we would try it, and well, it just seemed like a bit of harmless fun, really. I mean, I've I've tried the seances and things before, and it never really went anywhere. So thought it couldn't do any harm. So none of you, besides Neil, had 
done any occult work ever. Well, I mean, we've tried things. Uh, the seance and read the books and chanted a few things in the dark with the candles and, and all that sort of thing. I mean, who hasn't? But nothing ever happened, really, as far as I know. Are you telling me my father tricked you all? Or into, or manipulated you into agreeing to do this ritual for him to cross over or wherever he went? I wouldn't say that he manipulated us. He asked us if we wanted to try something, and we thought it would be a an interesting idea. I, I don't think he was tricking us or anything. I mean, we're all part of this society, and, and we wanted to find things beyond this world and and beyond what we see, and he seemed like a, a nice, a very nice man, and we knew about what he was doing to try to help his wife, as I said. We knew. We all knew. So... Did he, he say what was wrong with my mother? No. He, he didn't, really. He was, he was a very private man. Yeah, that runs in the family, usually. Okay. Do you rem- remember what happened when you all got knocked out? Or bef- right before that? Well, I don't really like to talk about it. Uh, it, it was a little traumatizing. Uh, I, I... He was... He was gone. You're... But I wasn't really, and she's just like obsessively kind of picking at, at her skirt still. Just, he, did, did he walk into a portal? Did he just disappear? Was there a particular smell? Portal? No, no, no. Nothing like that. There was, oh, it was absolutely dreadful. It's, we thought Wamsey had passed out you know he he was he just sort of slumped over and his eyes rolled back and and so we went to take care of him but he 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 attacked he and I wasn't looking at at your father I wasn't watching him I wasn't seeing what he was doing I was too busy watching one of my friends strangle my other friend and did Wormsley say anything say anything yeah did he say anything to key before he attacked him no he he just he stood up and and he he jumped at him and he grabbed him around the throat and he started shaking him and he was just it it, it was he had to have been possessed. He was possessed. And I don't know. I don't know by what, but he didn't stop until Keys was dead. And then, and then he went to the asylum. Well, uh, well, after he, yes, he's, he's there now. I, I assume it, he, he knew what, he knew what he did. It was it was like he knew, but he said it wasn't him. And that's when I noticed your father was gone. It wasn't him. What do you mean? It wasn't Wolmsley. No, oh, he, he would never do something like that. No. I don't know... What happened to your father? I don't know where he is. If I knew, I would tell you. I know... I know he had... hmm, He had an argument with with another member of the society. Um, I I saw it in in the hallway before we went and, and did all of this... All of this crazy whatever it was we did. There was a tall man. I didn't recognize him. I, I I didn't recognize him by name. I'd seen him at the society, but 
They were arguing and it seemed very heated. Very heated. Tall man wearing like a fedora type hat, long woolen coat. Uh, he he wasn't wearing a hat. Uh, he was sort of bald. Uh, but yeah, yes, I th- I think he was wearing a coat. It... Hey, Mike. Is um, Pierce yes. bald? Uh, no, no. Uh, Pierce still has his hair. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. I I don't know if maybe. This man, maybe he helped, he gave your father the ritual, or maybe they were arguing over the ritual, or maybe he wouldn't help, and that was what they were arguing. I, d- I really don't know, but he, this person might be able to help somehow. I don't know how, since as far as I know, your father hasn't been seen since, but... That's all I know. That's that's all I know. Is this tall man a part of the society? Uh, Have you seen he, him anywhere else? I, I saw him around the society uh, a few times. Um, yeah, I, I saw him a few times. I, I don't know his name uh, or, or who he was, and I haven't been back to the society since, so I don't know if he's still there. But he was he was part of it. I uh, uh, assume you're going to the house. Uh, yeah. Yes. I. Do you know how to get there? Uh, the directions I got were north of Camden, Big Red House, Camden Brook Road, past Regents Park. Uh, Do you have the actual address? Well, you you can't miss it with with those directions. The big red house, yes, that's it. Never seemed a little ominous, the color, until afterwards. I suppose so. Do you have nightmares after this? Yes. Not as frequently as uh, at first, but they're there. They don't go away. I'm not sure you ever get over... Seeing one of your close friends murder one of your other close friends, to be honest. Probably not. What about lights that were red, green, and yellow? What do you mean? Well, did you ever see anything that was red, green, and yellow while you were doing this? But there were there were these these kind of kind of lights. Like were they floating? Around? Yeah. Yes, they were. They were moving around the room, just sort of dancing and, and floating in the room, at the height of the ritual, I suppose is is what you'd say. They were beautiful but terrifying. Were they like in a circle? Like were they spinning in a circle? They they were just spinning, uh, spinning around the room. I wasn't paying as, as much attention to to them as through the whole thing, chanting and all of that sort of thing. But at the very end, they were floating over key at the very end. Well, I know you didn't want to talk about this, and I didn't want to be mean to you about it. However... You have to understand, I need to find my father. He went to help my mother, and instead left us both. Yes, I understand losing a family member. Just, it's very complicated, and it's very dangerous, whatever it was he got himself into. I wish I could tell you where he was, or where he is, I suppose, I don't know. Well, hopefully I was able I'm able to piece together enough information from you two that I can maybe figure something out. Two? Yeah, I spoke to Wolmsley. Is Is he all right? 
He was. What do you mean, was all right? Was? Is he not now? No. Please continue. The light lights... answers aren't helpful. Well, he, first of all, I'm sure you know, spoke very erratically. I did get some information out of him. The lights that you guys saw, his eyes changed those colors before he caught fire. He what? Uh, it's called uh, spontaneous combustion. Samantha rolls hand. <laughs> I didn't want to tell her. Why you gotta push me to tell you? Do it. Roll it. Uh, uh, should I roll my own dice, or are we using yeah, a dice? Just, that's fine. Just roll your own dice. Okay. Uh, I failed that with a seventy-four. Okay. Very good. <laughs> and let's see here. It's fair. <laughs> yep. All right, so just uh, in a headspace here, uh, you're understanding where you're at. Um, lose four points of sanity. Oh, my. Uh, Jesus. Mike, <laughs> I know he, uh, uh, Doc, says to Lillian that we're just waiting for our cue to go yes. back to the room. Yes. And he doesn't uh, explain what he's saying. Sure. So I think Samantha just kind of lets out this like startled little cry as she understands what Maeve is telling her and just sort of puts a hand to her chest and leans back in her in her chair a little bit. He's he's gone? Well, whatever was left of him, but it wasn't him. Not entirely. It was him. It, wh- whatever it was, it was it was gone. It no, was gone. It was not gone. It's I don't think it's still gone. What do you mean? I think that the ritual that you guys performed was an exchange ritual. Perhaps. I mean, this is just speculation. But I think in order for my father to cross over, something had to come out. So... And possess only. So you think... Do you think maybe... She's just sort of sitting there you can see the calculations kind of going in her mind do you think that if you send this thing back it will return your father if it's that kind of ritual if it's still here is he still there it's possible but I would think that now that it doesn't have a host I'm hoping maybe it'll go back to the house Um, otherwise it could be anywhere But yeah, I mean, in theory, yes, I could, maybe we could perform the ritual and do the reverse exchange. I'd have to do more research on the ritual itself and, yeah, see what's left at the house. Samantha just sort of stands up and says, well, I know it. The ritual? I performed it, if you remember. Well, yes. Do you remember the book that you got it out of? I didn't get it out of a book. Uh, We were taught it. Books at the house. I'm sure I could find it for you. Because I would think that something in it would maybe talk about exchange or what. Because usually if they're... If, If it is something this powerful that it took four of you there is always a price to pay yes that's that's how these things work so I've come to understand well then are you coming to the house with us then well you're not going to know the book unless I show it to you now are you no already taken two of my friends I'm not leaving it to take any more so I'll help you find the book, and if we find it, you're not casting this ritual without me. I'm the only one here who's done this before. Maybe I can help you send it back, but 
I'm not... I'm not letting anyone else try this alone. And I don't know necessarily that I'm going to cast the ritual until I do more research and figure out exactly what it is and what the other thing is that came over. Samantha sort of just leans forward and she just grabs your hand, which is uh, a bit of a surprise probably. And she looks at you very intently in the eyes and she's just promise me that you won't try to cast the ritual without my help. I don't know, I can't promise, of course, that it'll do any good, but I've done this. Let me help. Let me help fix this. If, if you if you do it. I promised that I would get a hold of you. Somebody who's already done it would help immensely. Okay. All right. But if you wouldn't mind, we can get the other two and maybe head out to the house. Oh, tonight. Uh, oh, uh, all right. Uh, yes. Uh, let me just, uh, I'll need to let my family know that I'll be out for the evening. They'll probably be glad to have me out of the house for a bit after a year. So, uh, yes, get get your friends and uh, I'll be ready in a few minutes. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm going to move the camera. So later that evening, Jack and Mr. Forsyth had left the Blue Pyramid Club and they are walking the streets of Soho. Uh, the drinks still flowing in their veins from the club and the uh, all of the uh, intoxications aplenty at the Blue Pyramid Club have been left behind them. They walk down Meads, Meard Street towards these arches. I actually would like to see if I can stop and at a phone somewhere. Yeah, easily. Yeah, I, I, I want to uh, telephone the hotel. Okay, you call the hotel. Get connected to our room. Hopefully there's somebody there. Yeah, they ring the room for you and they say, no, I, I'm sorry, sir, there's uh, no one picking up. Okay, could you uh, leave a message for me? Of course. Tell them Jack and Forsyth are meeting somebody in Soho. Should be back by morning. I will do so, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The night air here has gotten a tad chilly. And, uh, just walking down the street, you're doing your best to kind of keep the wind from picking up too much, using some buildings there to keep you both a little bit out of the wind. Uh, but the arches themselves aren't hard to find. There is a uh, series of them at the northern end of the street. Before we get to there, say a mm -hmm. couple blocks short of it, I'm going to pull off into a uh, doorway to kind of cut the wind. Yep. And I'll look at Jack and I'll say, Jack, um, this might go better if I go a bit ahead of you. I would feel more comfortable if you were uh, backing me up. Okay, we can do that. I mean, whoever left that message knows that we're together, so there'll be two of us, but... Well, they knew we were at the table together. All right, you go ahead. I'm going to definitely not mention also that I would like him to have a chance to get away if something bad happens. I wish everyone was of you, sir. Okay, so you're going to continue on down the street to the arches? Absolutely. Okay. You get to this section of uh, Meard Street and you pass, you begin to pass through the arches one after another. And there's probably just, uh, there's not too much distance between them. But you can tell the area here is kind of like, a, it's not so much a dead end, but there's a, a courtyard here where these arches are. And uh, the buildings pull off just, uh, the, the buildings actually come in a little bit closer. So there's well, there's a lot more shadows here, that's for sure. And given that it's night and the relative scantness of the light, although there is some, it does seem to frame this section of London as a, a little bit darker than some of the others. I'm going to stop, not right at the first arch, but maybe the second or third. Can I do a uh, spot hidden? Absolutely. See what I see? Oh, that's a hard success, 12 under 57. Okay. Uh, you give the place a good look over, and it 
I mean, all except for maybe a stray dog or whatnot. It's fairly empty. Okay. I'll keep going. Okay. Keep going. Uh, the last arch, at the, at the end of the last arch here, there is a, uh, what looks like the remnants of an old well or some type of fountain that's been it's been turned off or it's definitely a stone circle it looks like it is probably a well or a fountain at one point but it's again it's gone into disrepair jack where are you at i'm just a little ways behind him maybe a half a block or so yeah he's there he makes it to the end all right i want to i'm going to move so that i can see him it's pretty dark down there I keep my him in uh, eyesight and then also kind of uh, see what I can see uh, coming and going. Okay. I just kind of want to skirt the well. I don't want to get too close to it. Sure. Sure. I remember the last time I saw a well. It didn't go oh, well. Yeah. As do I. Hmm. You hear a soft voice, Mr. Forsyth. Where's it coming from? Left or right? From or? one of the, uh, to your left. And a elegant, beautiful, dark-skinned woman steps out from behind one of these arches. This is your waitress from earlier in the evening. She calmly and carefully walks towards you. I doff my hat, madam. Good evening. My name is Yarisha, and I'm hoping that you can help me. She looks around. Your friend, where is he? He's nearby. He is the one who asked about the spice merchant. Yes. Yes, Zahara. This uh, Zahra Shafiq, he's, she is most dangerous. You see her turn and look up the street, and she looks in... Jack, you see her look in your direction. She turns back to you. I need your help. What help? You've made an inquiry at the club. Shafiq, she is a member of an organization. A dangerous one. Unfortunately... I have been on the wrong end of this organization already. My my boyfriend was killed by it. You see, deep here in Soho, there is an organization called the Brotherhood. This spice merchant Shafiq is one of them. She helps run them. And when my boyfriend Badru began asking too many questions, they, they murdered him. I heard you at the club... Uh, or your your friend make an inquiry about her and I thought better that you know the truth about who she is before something terrible happens to you why didn't you go to the police yes the police they have eyes and ears at the police as well these smashers or policemen from the yard whatever they call them they don't listen to my story is, well, if I, my skin was like yours. And where is my proof? I have been told that he is dead. They have threatened me. Why didn't you leave then? I have nowhere to go. The club is my only source of income. And I'm scared for my life. I'm scared that if I left, they would track me down. But let me be clear. What I want... And what I am offering are two different things. I offer you a warning to stay away from the Brotherhood, to stay away from Shafiq. She's dangerous. But what I want is revenge. I don't know that either of us can get what we want. That may be true. This Brotherhood, though, they have their hands in many things. Does the bartender, is he, is he one of them? Absolutely. As is the man who manages the bar. The entire bar is a front for them. It is how they earn their money. Or one of the ways. Do you know anything about the Penhue Foundation? Penhue. Well... Evidently, she's done work for them. I do know that uh, her spice shop, she has entertained men from the Penhue Foundation there. And I do know that she has a friendship with a, a man who works there. I have seen him at the club before. Very rich, distinguished gentleman. Perhaps you have heard of him? He sounds familiar. His name is Edward Gavigan. Yes, that's a name I've heard. I know that 
Shafiq and Gavigan have uh, a location far from London where they they meet. I know that they collect their brethren at the club once a month into vehicles and they drive somewhere outside of London. I, I Again, I do not know specifically where. What time of the month? Usually around the new moon. I look up at the sky reflexively. What, <laughs> what phase is the moon in? It's probably going to be new moon in uh, about a week or so. You can still see some of it. Well, madam, I, I thank you for the warning. I wish I had something better to offer you. You do not need to offer me much, but if you are here and you are considering doing business with her, then you need to think again. It wasn't my plan to buy any spices. Ah, then your friend then. She points in Jack's direction, even though Jack's like a block away. I doubt it was his plan either. Mm. Well, I have to get back to the club. Yes, be, be careful. I'm going to pull a business card out of my pocket. I'm going to write the number of the hotel. Okay. On the back. And I'm going to say if you get in any immediate trouble, uh, get away and call this number and uh, leave a message. I appreciate that. And, And I'm sorry... We were not formally introduced to the club, of course. My name is Lawrence. Thank you, Lawrence. It's been my pleasure, madam. She gives you a slight but courteous bow, almost. I I tip my head. It's at that point that she turns and goes beyond this last archway Mm -hmm. and then slips down into the alley between the, the buildings here. And within moments is melded with the shadows there. I put my hat back on, straighten my jacket. I take one more look around, and then I head back towards uh, Jack. You head back towards Jack, so the two of you rejoin. So how was your liaison? (sighs) Too short. The lady seems to be under a misapprehension. She thinks that you're wanting to do business with this... uh, Spice woman. Well, that was the impression I was trying to give. Well, then you succeeded. She says don't do it. She says the uh, she's connected with the Brotherhood. And uh, they're lousy in the club. And she has a connection with Gavigan over at uh, the Penn Hue. And she also said that they go out once a month at the new moon and do rituals out at the, uh, out somewhere outside of London. But they all get in cars and go out and and do their, do their thing. Well, that's interesting. I can't think of a better time to go visit the Penhue Foundation than when they're all gone. And I will move the camera over to uh, Limehouse. So it's pretty late in the evening for you, Mr. Granger, but, uh, It seems, anyway, that your work is not without its fruit. So you were spending the evening, this evening specifically, scoping out the docks area and keeping appraised of uh, the things that are going on here, yes? Yes. Um, So you had found earlier, you'd seen a truck that was at the Penhu Foundation, and it, dr- it had driven off in the direction of the docks, but you'd lost track of it because you were doing, you know, a bunch of other things. Other things, yeah. There was stuff to do. You get a sprig of luck. And that sprig of luck is seeing that truck one more time through the docks. Is it like in motion or is it parked? Uh, it is parked, actually. Oh, that's awfully convenient. What's it parked in front of? It is parked next to. <laughs> it is parked. Near the docks are uh, actually in in the dock area, uh, near one of the offloading and onloading locations. It is sitting outside of um, a warehouse in Rope Makers Field, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it it has uh, the warehouse itself has a, a name on it that says Punit Punit 
Shandhari. I butchered that. Looks like it's a just a dock warehouse. Okay. Uh, but there are some men milling about the truck, and there is a boat in dock as well. Yeah, let's take a. I'll take a, a gander at the boat. I don't see if I get to like an obvious name or any uh, markings might indicate like where it's from or who it belongs to. So the boat is it's a it's a merchant boat in dock. Um, you can see that it's tagged with the name the Ivory Wind, mm-hmm. and you see that there's three or four people who are actually loading crates onto this boat right at the moment. Okay, which is again a bit startling because they're working quite literally almost in the middle of the night. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, sp- <laughs> the spice must flow, I guess. Indeed. I'm not going to get too close to their, uh, to their operation as much as I just, I really wanted to get a bead on kind of the, what they're operating out of. And it sounds like, I mean, it, it's, it's like some movement channel, right? If a ship can come in here, it can dock here. They can unload and offload it here. This is probably where Penu gets, anything it's getting directly if this is like a merchant ship you can tell it's definitely the same truck because that logo ferris and sons is on the side of the truck and there's no ferris to be had here nope <laughs> <laughs> i will chuckle to myself it makes it makes sense in like some regards because yeah, you know there sure. are probably thousands of trucks that run in and out of london and uh-huh. no one like no, no one's, one's gonna, gonna no one's gonna care oh, it makes total sense all right all right i'm gonna leave <laughs> Okay. Um, you said they were loading things onto the ship. Yep. Okay. I can't. I can't be bothered to know where it's going or what it is right now. If I had more time, or if it was parked, maybe. Sure. <laughs> my intent is to make my way around until morning, when I would be calling on the uh, the Carlton. Is it the Ritz? Yeah, the Ritz Carlton. Yeah. So what I might do, honestly, is uh, find a place to, so I can't sleep. Well, this alley honestly looks a lot more comfortable than that roof. Yeah. And I'm thinking I might find a nice shady corner to hunker down in that'll still give me a view of what they're doing. So maybe I can, if there's any um, scaffolding I could crawl up on or. I would say that uh, it's probably a fair assumption that there's a way for you to get up there. I mean, these the buildings around here are full of the sides of them are, are fairly easy, whether it's a drain pipe or whether it's a Locking scaffolding it, piece. Yeah. Right. Just stuff here. Okay. Yeah. There's I'll find a, all over the place. I'm going to find a comfy spot to take a, to take a nap. It's been a pretty long day and, um, I will lazily kind of doze and half ass pay attention to what they're doing. I'll wait for a loud noise to wake me up. <laughs> sure. Or the sun. One of those two things will probably happen. Okay. Do you begin your camp out? Mm-hmm. I finished my last sandwich. You tuck that uh, piece of uh, sandwich into your mouth and kind of press your shoulder against the uh, the building and the wood of the scaffolding that you had here. You get a bit of a, a brick to ease into, and you just watch and learn as crate after crate slowly comes off this white truck and is lowered into the hold of the ship. Busy bees. And that is where I'm going to call the session to a close. So uh, I would like to thank all of you for listening. I hope you're enjoying masks as much as we are. I'd like to thank our guest star, Rena, from those of you who listen to our uh, Orient Express game are, are fairly well aware of her at this point. If you're not already, you're not listening. So and if you're not listening, you should be listening. So I want to thank her and uh, we will see you all next week. <laughs>